You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. The Brooke Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Now, here's your host, Radical Ross Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokettes and non-toking lovers of liberty. It is Friday, November 21st, 2014, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Welcome to the weekend, and what a fine weekend it will be. If you're snowed in, stay warm, stay cozy, and sit back for the next two hours as we fill you in on the latest in marijuana news views and interviews that you can use in the cannabis community. We got a very special panel discussion coming up on tonight's show that I'm really excited to talk about. This is a subject that crosses the barriers between the marijuana community and the what about the children community, the frightened parents who fear marijuana legalization. Our discussion today is marijuana is safer than child protective services. And joining us will be Mindy Griffiths from the Human Solution as well as Billy Fisher from the Fight for Lily Foundation and Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International. They've been doing a lot of work lately in Washington State over some cases where good, loving parents are facing the loss of their children over their marijuana use. And they've been doing some pretty creative tactics for letting the public know what's happening behind the closed doors in the courtroom. So we will talk to them in both segments today, starting at half past. And who knows, maybe we'll even take it into hour two. Also on today's show, we're going to go behind the headlines where I saw some alarming headlines about Washington State marijuana DUI numbers. And I took a look at the numbers in context. I'm going to show you why they don't really prove what the headlines think they prove and actually show that cops are abusing the marijuana DUI system in Washington State. So stay tuned for that coming up right after the 420 Radio News. In the headlines today for the Radio News, the Washington State Legislature is gearing up to tackle the issue of medical marijuana this winter in their legislative session. There's been a bill introduced in the federal Congress to allow VA doctors to recommend medical marijuana in the states that have legalized it. The top prosecutors in Alaska are saying they're going to continue prosecuting marijuana crimes. The D.C. City Council is looking at legalization of marijuana markets and in Colorado, perhaps an answer to their problem of marijuana banking for the legal pot industry. All that coming up right after the first break here on the Russ Belleville Show. Also on the show today, we'll do some drug war data mining, continuing uh, kind of a primer that we started yesterday on basic Excel tricks for putting together uh, election data uh, on election night or or for for that matter, anything that you might be voting on. We'll continue that showing you how to uh, copy and paste data and to adjust formulas and use table settings and such to make your data look really pretty for your next presentation. Then we'll take things into hour two. Toker Talk Radio will take your calls at 971-533-7111. We'll also get a preview of tonight's Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. Going to be really fun tonight in the studio. We've got three guys from the band Wear Squatch coming in to talk to us. So we are going to have a packed house and we're going to be debuting all sorts of Wear Squatch music. So stay tuned for that. Herb will give us a preview in our daily toker tunes for Rocker Fr- Rockin' Friday coming up at 420 Pacific time. We're here every weekday at 3 p.m. Pacific. If you don't catch all the shows, you can catch them on replays at 6 o'clock Pacific time. Also the next day at 3 and 6 a.m. if you're up that early. Coming up next, the 420 Radio News. Stick around. This is the Russ Belleville Show. Nation. 
420 Radio, your ticket to the High Times Cannabis Cups. Hey, what's up? This is Killer Mike, one half of Run the Jewels, and I'm telling you, November 23rd through 27th, you need to be at Cannabis Cup. I did it last year, and I got so high, I can tell you what color Jesus' furniture is. I got so high, I kissed the sky twice. I got so much enlightenment, I know Buddha's last name. Do you feel what I'm telling you right now? The people are great. You don't have to search or call your sketch-ass dealer who won't call you back. You don't have to go lurking through the hood to find good smoke. You need to get out of the country. You've been sitting on your block too long smoking weed. Get out and have an adventure. See you at Cannabis Cup, November 23rd and 27th. Yeah. Four Twenty Radio dot org is proud to replay Weejicated Talk Radio with Ruby Lexington, Nikki Fox, Steve the Caregiver, and Jeff Kaufman from Arizona. Weejicated exists to help change the cultural response to cannabis through intelligent, meaningful conversations about how the industry is unfolding in America and beyond. Catch the replay Mondays at ten Pacific on Four Twenty Radio dot org. Hey, this is Willie Nelson for Norman. And I smoke pot and I like it a lot. I learned a long time ago that marijuana is a lot safer than alcohol. There's nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana by adults. It's time we stopped arresting and started respecting those who smoke marijuana responsibly. To learn what you can do to help, contact normal at norml.org or call toll free 888-67-NORMAL. It's time for the 420 Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available daily on our website at 420radio.org. Now, here's Russ Melville with your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds. This is your 420 Radio News for Friday, November 21st, 2014. The Washington... Washington state legislature is gearing up to tackle medical marijuana again this winter, a year after failing to reach agreement on a merger of the recreational and medical industries. This time, though, the players have changed. There are now dozens of licensed growers and retailers in the recreational pot business, all worried about their bottom lines. Medical patients and sellers bristle at efforts to create a registry of patients and to lump them in with recreational buyers. Their lobbying, along with disputes over whether medical patients should get tax breaks and whether cities and counties should get a share of marijuana revenue, scuttled a deal in the 2014 session. One way the path could be smoother, for the first time, amending I-502 will require a simple majority of lawmakers, not the supermajorities required in the first two years of an initiative's existence. A bill introduced in Congress would allow the Department of Veterans Affairs doctors to recommend medical marijuana for their patients. The Veterans Equal Access Act, introduced Thursday by Representatives Earl Blumenauer and Dana Rohrbacher with 10 bipartisan co-sponsors, would lift a ban on VA doctors giving opinions or recommendations about medical marijuana to veterans who live in states where medical marijuana is permitted. Nearly 30% of veterans who served in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars suffer from PTSD and depression, according to a 2012 report from the Department of Veterans Affairs. In a recent study, patients who smoked cannabis saw an average 75% reduction in PTSD symptoms. Currently, 23 states allow medical use of marijuana. Ten of those states, as well as Guam, which legalized medical marijuana this month, allow doctors to recommend medical marijuana for PTSD-related symptoms. One of Alaska's top prosecutors said the state will continue to prosecute people for possessing and selling marijuana for the time being, despite a pending voter-approved law to legalize small amounts of pot. Quote, we are not blind or oblivious to the fact that there is a change coming, but the change is not here yet, end quote, said John Skidmore, director of the criminal division for the Alaska Department of Law, continuing, quote, we did communicate to our folks that right now it is business as usual. We are evaluating what to do in the future, end quote. Law enforcement officers continue to cite people for misconduct involving a controlled substance in the sixth degree for possessing small amounts of marijuana. An Anchorage man was cited by Alaska State Troopers for possessing less than an ounce of marijuana Saturday during a traffic stop near Cantwell. The marijuana was confiscated. Quote, technically, it's still against the law, end quote, Troopers spokeswoman Megan Peters said, quote, we have to enforce the law, end quote. 
On Tuesday, a D.C. Council committee is scheduled to take up the Marijuana Legalization and Regulation Act of 2013, a bill that would allow the sale, taxation, and regulation of legal marijuana in the district. With scant weeks remaining in the D.C. Council session, the fact that the Committee on Business Regulatory and Consumer Affairs would spend time marking up a lengthy, complex bill would seem to indicate that lawmakers are on the fastest of tracks to give D.C. residents and visitors the opportunity to purchase marijuana in the wake of the November 4th passage of a legalization initiative. It doesn't appear that package will be headed to Capitol Hill intact. Other committees must mark up the two bills, including the Public Safety and Judiciary Committee, which is set to move another major piece of legislation next week, the permanent version of a bill permitting some residents to legally carry handguns in the city. Colorado has granted a charter for the first financial institution to serve its cash-only marijuana industry. However, before it can open permanently for business, action is also required by the National Credit Union Administration and Federal Reserve. The Colorado Division of Financial Services issued the charter Wednesday to the Fourth Corner Credit Union, which could open in January, the Denver Post reported Thursday. Fourth Corner must get a master account from the Federal Reserve and insurance from the National Credit Union Administration. Fourth Corner can operate until the NCUA makes a decision on the latter. Attorney Mark Mason, an organizer for Fourth Corner, said the NCUA review could take as long as two years. Fourth Corner, whose board members include Denver Councilman Chris Nevitt, intends to serve any legal marijuana enterprise. It will also serve nonprofits that support legal pot, said attorney Douglas Friednash, who incorporated the credit union after the charter was approved. This has been your 420 Radio News for Friday, November 21st, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. 420 Radio, turning red states and blue states green. Petardos, brócolos, porros, canudos, petas, macas, fumo chinas, pedro, los placas de costo goloso, fumo y toso, los ojos rojos, borrosos, fumo estacas, modo gro... Deja tu mundo gris y vente a mi país con High Times a la 27 a Cannabis Cup en Ámsterdam del 23 al 27 de noviembre para perfumar las calles con el denso aroma de lo mejor de lo mejor. Los jueces podrán atender charlas, echar un vistazo a las últimas parafernalias y botar la hierba o costo que más les ha gustado. Por la ventana de los coffee shops se asoma una cabeza de denso aroma que echa a volar y perfuma tu hogar. Pero no fumes tumbao. Vente a los conciertos, el evento con artistas que incluyen Revolution, entre otros. El jueves 27 de noviembre estate para cuando High Times regale la copa de cannabis al mejor verde o marrón del mundo. Estácate unos macas y fíjate con el humo en la High Times Cannabis Cup en Ámsterdam y no rechaces ni una chusta. Para más información y entradas visita cannabiscup.com. Bien fumo tabaco, alquitrán y brea, se craquea, mi traquea, quizás sea mejor el dolor que la ansiedad que esto crea. Y eso Dios me ama, no hay... If you're an adult who enjoys a good beer, there's a similar product you might want to know about. One without all the calories and serious health problems. Less toxic so it doesn't cause hangovers or overdose deaths, and it's not linked to violence or reckless behavior. Marijuana. Less harmful than alcohol, and time to treat it that way. For more information, visit MarijuanaIsSafer.org. The pistachio. Green, natural, and available without prescription in all 50 states. He's fine. Welcome back, everyone. 14 after the hour. And today in Behind the Headlines, I'm asking, what do Washington State marijuana DUI numbers actually tell us? Because the media in Washington State are trumpeting this headline, Marijuana DUI spike following legalization. As TV news station KXLY in Spokane, Washington reported, the Washington State Patrol's toxicology lab produced 988 THC positive tests from drivers in 2012 and then 1,362 THC positive tests in 2013. Quote, the state numbers for 2014 aren't in yet. However, the Spokane County Prosecutor's Office is sure when they do, there will be another increase, writes reporter Allie Norton. The number of cases from the first part of this year was on the verge of surpassing last year's amount. That was even before marijuana hit retail stores, so we could easily see more than double marijuana DUIs from last year, end quote. Now, this kind of hysteria 
is sure to be seized upon by prohibitionists nationwide in their campaigns to forestall the inevitable marijuana legalization coming to your state. Now, look, we really have no idea whether more people are driving under the influence of marijuana. All we know is we're catching more of them. A more accurate headline would be marijuana DUI prosecutions spike following legalization. Think of it this way. If a fisherman comes back from the river one day with two fish, and then the next day he comes back with 20 fish, it doesn't necessarily mean there are more fish in the river. He may have just traded in his fishing pole for a net. Prior to legalization in Washington state, there was an impairment standard for a marijuana DUI. A cop would do a sobriety test, rule out alcohol, get a blood draw, and that would all go to trial where maybe there'd be a DUI conviction if they could prove the driver was indeed impaired. Cops had a fishing pole and would catch a couple of fish here and there. After legalization in Washington state, the law included a five nanograms of active THC per milliliter of blood per se impairment standard. A cop will do a sobriety test, rule out alcohol, get a blood draw, and if it comes up five or greater, that's a guaranteed DUI conviction, whether the driver was impaired or not. Cops now have a net, and they're pulling in more fish. Since five nanograms is an absurdly low level of active THC for a regular marijuana user, many people are subject to being guilty of DUI for merely driving. No level of THC is scientifically accurate at matching how high someone is. Those new grandma tokers are sure to be stoned at five nanograms, while Snoop Dogg could give up weed yesterday and be over five nanograms tomorrow. All this system has proven is that when you give cops an automatic guilt target to shoot for, they'll aim for it. Even the trooper they quoted in the Spokane story alludes to this phenomenon. He said, quote, you're more in tune to be looking for it nowadays adding that making DUI arrests is, quote, what we're out here to do, end quote. Now, whether looking for it refers to drivers exhibiting signs of impairment or drivers exhibiting signs of being a marijuana consumer, that's open to interpretation. It makes you wonder, though, if the five nanogram per se DUI law was supposed to deter so-called stone driving, why are DUI arrests going up? As these arrests go up, the cops are catching more minnows than tuna in their nets. Remember those 988 THC positive tests from 2012? Of those, 62% of them were at the 5 nanogram limit or over, back when there was no 5 nanogram target to aim for. In 2013, of those 1,362 THC positive tests, only 53% were over the 5 nanogram limit. In 2012, the average THC concentration was 6.2 nanograms and the maximum was 90 nanograms. In 2013, it, the average went down to 5.2 nanograms and the maximum went down to 77 nanograms. So if the drivers that the police are catching are less stoned, why are they catching more of them? And again, it's because now they have an easy target to, to aim at, and now they're more aware of looking for marijuana-impaired drivers. And again, whether that's actual impairment or just the signs of a car that would seem to be driven by someone who might have five nanograms of marijuana in their system. We've shown many times the example done by KIRO TV in Seattle, where they put people behind the wheel at four to 11 times that five nanogram limit and found them to be driving just fine to borderline. And as we look at the fatality and crash statistics in Washington state, we don't see them wildly swinging upwards or downwards. And marijuana still remains 4% or less of all of the DUI cases that are prosecuted in Washington state with, of course, alcohol being the one that is by far the greatest impairment driving offender, something 82, 84%, something like that. 
So long as we live in a place where bars have parking lots, I'm still not convinced stone drivers are a problem. Sorry, I picked the wrong week. Quit sniffing blue. All right, folks, it's 420 in Denver, Colorado, where marijuana is legal. It's also 420 throughout the rest of the mountain time zone, where marijuana is decidedly not legal. You have to do something to change that. You can get involved, make it happen near you. Check out normal.org and find out how to form your own chapter. It's a lot of fun, and it can lead to all sorts of interesting places. 420 Radio. Tune in, turn on, get high, Lee Educated. Hey Tokers and Tokets, Radical Russ here for the Canador, a practical solution to keep herbs from drying. The Canador is the perfect airtight storage system for your fine herbs. From the half inch thick walnut and cherry wood construction, clear top perforated jars for storage, and the humidity bead system that keeps your herbs at a perfect 65% relative humidity. I keep all my herbs in the Canador, and you should too. Check out Canador.com for more information. 420radio.org is proud to replay the Hollywood Hemptress Hour with Terry Joyce from Portland, Oregon. Terry Joyce is a stand-up comedian and writer and was a former reality television star from the first season of Last Comic Standing. In 2007, she was caught up in a marijuana dispensary raid that made her a cannabis activist. Catch the replays Tuesday at 12 Pacific on 420radio.org. Get dot buzz. Dot buzz is the internet platform that fuels community interest, excitement, and new experiences. Dot buzz is the premier online destination for internet users seeking the latest news on a variety of topics. Dot buzz appeals to groups active in blogging, communications, journalism, advertising, and marketing. Dot buzz offers registrants a stronger alternative to the shrinking namespace of existing top-level domain names such as dot com, dot net, and dot org. Get your name now at get.buzz. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. All right, welcome back, everyone. 22 after the hour in the Drug War Data Mine today, we're going to continue along with our look at simple Excel use. You know, maybe a lot of people out there already know how to run Excel pretty well, and this is some some basic stuff, but, you know, there's others that may have not had this opportunity, and I'm using a little bit of my experience as an Excel instructor, some of the day job I had before I got into this, to perhaps help people out. Yesterday, we gave you the basics of putting together a simple election chart where we would have a place like, say, Oregon, vote and the number of votes yes and votes no for a particular measure. In this case, these are the numbers for measure 91 and how to come up with a percentage percentage, of course, being able to divide the yes votes by the total number of votes. And we came up with this formula, B2 divided by parentheses, B2 plus C2 close parentheses. The nice thing about Excel is once you come up with a formula, it's really easy to use it in other places. And let's just remind you of some of the uh, tricks that we were using yesterday. We're going to come up with a new column here, difference, to tell us how many, what the difference was in votes from yes to no. And anytime you want to do a formula, you just start it with equals. And I like to use the mouse to select what we're uh, going to use. So we want to find out what is the yes votes, clicking on that, B2, typing minus, and then clicking on C2, the no votes, B2 minus C2 gives us the answer of 179,107 votes. So quite a overwhelming uh, majority there for uh, measure 91 as you look at it. Now, suppose you also wanted to figure out some of the other states. You wanted to keep track on election night of Florida and Washington, D.C. and Alaska. The nice thing about Excel is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. My favorite part of Excel is this little dot in the corner. I don't know if you can see that little dot, but when you move your little white cross cursor toward it, it turns into a black cross, a thinner black cross. That little thin black cross is like magic, and I'll show you how. You've already got this one row. Oregon, it's yes and no votes, it's percentage, and it's difference. 
and you'd like to have three more rows that are exactly like that. It's really simple. Once you've highlighted the cells that you already like, grab that little dot, make sure it's turned into a black cross before you start clicking and dragging. But once you see that black cross, click and drag down three more rows. This will copy all of those items down for you. Now it's just a matter of getting rid of the stuff you don't need. Now be careful at this point because you don't want to lose these percentages or these differences because these are formulas. And if you're never sure if they're formula, just click on them and you can tell up there in this little spot that, yeah, that's a formula. Notice how the formulas changed when it was in this cell, it was B2 and C2, but when it moved down a row, it's B3 and C3. Excel's smart enough to adjust those formulas to match whichever row it's in. So all we need to do is to get rid of just the parts that aren't formulas. Now you could do this manually because this is a really small spreadsheet. It's very easy to just select those and press delete and you'd be done. However, I have a trick that will help you to pick things in a spreadsheet that aren't formulas. If you press control G as in golf, you'll get this pop-up that says go to. And in this little button at the bottom of this go to pop-up, if you choose special, you can choose all sorts of interesting things. Things that are not formulas are called constants. If you pick constants, you can choose what kind of constants, numbers, text, logicals, and errors. And we'll deal with those in another lesson. If we choose just numbers, in this case, we're saying just highlight the cells that have numbers typed into them rather than formula numbers. Clicking OK there will highlight just those vote total numbers. Wouldn't help us in this example because we don't want to lose the Oregon numbers. But for future reference, just realize that Control G and Special have some pretty interesting things. We can get rid of what we don't want. And you'll notice this thing that says Div 0. That's just because you don't have numbers filled in. As soon as you fill in numbers, even if it's as low as 10 to 5, you're going to start getting your formulas to fill in. And as you get more numbers throughout the night, you can fill those in and the formulas will automatically change for you. This is how I was able to update the big board for our marijuana election night 2014. If you want more Excel tips, email me. 420 Radio, the world's voice of marijuana legalization. Are you a hypocrite? If you live a closeted cannabis lifestyle, you are. Read about seven people living a closeted cannabis lifestyle who are on the verge of coming out in The Hypocrites by Mara K. Eaton. Available at areyouahypocrite.net. You can purchase the book on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, also available on iTunes. Check out Mara K. Eaton on Facebook as well. Learn more at areyouahypocrite.net. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 1920s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stopped arresting responsible marijuana smokers. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. Growing plants indoors can be a rewarding hobby, but electricity bills can go through the roof. Then you have to cool down all those big hot lights. It can drive a grower insane. With Lush LED Lighting, you can solve many of these issues and double your rewards. Matt and his scientists have developed the perfect light for flowering plants with far less cost and heat. And the results? Very effective. Check out LushLEDLighting.com right now and tell them Radical Russ sent you. The cannabis community is a diverse set of people from all walks of life, conservative and liberal, black and white, straight and gay, rich and poor, and everyone in between. Learn more about the people we are freeing from adult marijuana prohibition in our Cannabis Community Chat. 
Welcome back, everyone. 29 after the hour. And today we've got a special panel discussion that we're going to engage in entitled Marijuana is Safer Than Child Protective Services. Throughout our news coverage, you've heard many stories where parents have had to face the specter of child protective services when they've been discovered to be marijuana users, even legal medical marijuana patients in legal medical marijuana states. Joining us on the telephone to talk about this, we have three guests. We've got Mindy Griffiths from the Human Solution. Mindy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Hi, nice to have you here. Billy Fisher is here from the Fight for Lily Foundation. Hello, Billy. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Glad to hear you. And also our good friend Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Russ. Thanks for having us. We're so glad to have you here. Let's start with Sarah. Uh, of course, we're friends, and we've got a lot of other mutual friends throughout the marijuana movement. And I saw recently, I think it might have been on Bill Espenson's Facebook, uh, pictures from, uh, I forget, I think it was Spokane, but I'm not sure, Bellingham maybe, uh, where you guys had chalked up sidewalks and were dealing with another one of these CPS cases. Tell us what's going on lately in this fight against CPS. Yes, it was Bellingham, and it was a current case that is ongoing. At the time, it was allegations of parents' marijuana use. Um, the parents, Vicka and Jesse Thompson, are from Bellingham, and they own a grow shop. I think it's called The Grow Shop. And they also had a patient cooperative in the back. And the city said it shut it down. And then CPS came in and started investigating and just all sort of allegations started to arise and social workers were saying that it was illegal in Washington as well as dangerous to the children. And so we got involved to help kind of show the support that the community is willing to give to this family. And we had a nice time chalking up the sidewalks out in front of the CPS office. Yeah. All sorts of messages out there. Marijuana is safer than child protective services. What are some of the things you'd, you'd write out there for the public to see? Well, we do a lot of educating about both marijuana as well as the issue with Child Protective Services and how it has become a corrupt business, and they're making money off of taking these children. So some of the things were like, everybody in here makes money off of their kids or um, stop the federal adoption incentives, and then, of course, marijuana is safer than CPS. Mm. What has the and, reaction been from uh, CPS workers as they go to work and walk those sidewalks? Well, they weren't too happy with us. Um, we could wa see them watching us from the windows, and a couple of them came out. Um, the first rally, we had two of them, and the first one was a meeting that the parents were supposed to be having with Child Protective Services. And the parents said that they would be willing to do the meeting, except they didn't have their attorney prints, and so they wanted to record the meeting. And anytime you pull out a video camera around a social worker, they tend to run away. <laughs> and so they canceled the meeting on them, but had the meeting anyway, which is another tactic of CPS. But we went outside and started coloring, and two social workers came out to try to convince the father to come back inside without the video cameras, without the attorney, and have this meeting anyway. Um, they weren't very happy with what we were writing and what we were doing and the scene that we were making. Mm. Mindy, uh, let's go to you. You're with the human solution and you work on uh, many cases where people are fighting the system uh, with respect to their marijuana use. Uh, in this case of uh, Vicka and Jesse Thompson, aside from the, the marijuana use or the marijuana uh, business, are they alleging any harm to these kids? Have they shown them to be beaten or neglected or starved or anything like that? Um, no. And I, you know, I like to say that I also have a background in education. I was a teacher, and I have a master's degree. So I've spent a lot of time with a lot of children, and I got to spend time with their son. And very well adjusted, no detachment disorder issues, um, healthy, well-fed, beautiful, pink, rosy cheeks, and um, just the sweetest little boy. So um, I, didn't, I didn't see anything like that. And do you have any numbers for us or any idea how often or how much this is occurring throughout uh, America? It doesn't seem like it's really tracked very well if you want to find statistics on kids taken because of marijuana. Do you have any ideas? 
I don't, but I am definitely going to look into that because I'm interested on what those statistics are. All right. Well, one of the statistics, of course, we've got Billy Fisher on the line, and he's with the Fight for Lily Foundation. And uh, you pretty much exemplify this whole topic that we're talking about, Billy. Tell folks your story and about the Fight for Lily. Um, well, thank you, Russ. Uh, we ended up, me and or Sarah and I, I should say, um, about a year and a half ago, um, my daughter was put into a situation where um, we kind of had to go in and, and ask for help through CPS. Um, CPS ended up turning on me saying that because of my medical marijuana uh, use that I wasn't able or capable to parent my child um, and that I was actually more uh, of a harm to her and she was, you know, in harm with me. And so it just became a huge battle and we had a judge that was just really anti pot, I guess you would say. And she straight up said that I, I didn't have a recommendation from a, you know, a correct provider, even though we were sitting there looking at the law, you know, she never did any research and she just flat out wanted me to go to rehab and all this other stuff. Um, just because I use medical marijuana and I chose not to use the prescription pills that my doctor was trying to get me to use. Um, and so it, it took a, you know, almost a year to get her, but we finally was able, you know, to get Lily home. So I kind of know the situation that they're going through. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm, I'm not going to get too involved in, into what, you know, my case is, but with the foundation, Vicka got a hold of everybody. Um, we seen the thing, you know, her, you know, cry for help. And Sarah and I looked at each other and said, we need to help this girl. Um, we, we contacted, uh, the human solution. You know, we all drove up there. Um, Sarah and I drove up from Idaho. Mickey came from Oregon. Um, or Mindy, sorry. <laughs> Mindy came from Oregon. We had just a bunch of, bunch of people there. Jared Alloway was a part of it. And it was just amazing seeing everybody come together for this one family mm. and we need, you know, it's just DCH or, uh, yeah. So, CPS so yes, need to get their crap together. Yeah. So you were, so Billy, you were, uh, denied, uh, access to your daughter for a year. Was that, is that correct? Well, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I had two hour visits a week. Okay. So between two to four hour visits and that's if the foster parents wanted to, you know, bring my child there. And, and, uh, what was, what was it that brought this to CPS's attention? Um, we, we called CPS because my child was left in a care of a pedophile and the judge was like, well, I need to get both parents involved, but I can't because one of them is in the hospital. So he called CPS from the bench and asked CPS to go pick up the child until we were able to get into a courtroom, you know, together and whatnot. Hmm. Um, that's the shelter care hearing is the first hearing you usually go to. And that's where they, you know, it's placement hearing also. This and is... so they place the child with either parent, you know, or a parent um, that is capable to take care of that child. And when we went in there, um, they said I wasn't capable because I was a medical marijuana patient. Wow. And so Lily got put in foster care for, you know, 310 days. Well, how, how horrific is that, that you, you think you're doing the right thing by going to the authorities and CPS and they're supposed to protect your child and they go and turn on you uh, is that's gotta be pretty shocking. Yeah, that's actually, that's kind of funny. You said that because when, when we were all done and said with this, after we had went to the appeal, it's, um, we had revised the judge's order. The judge was released from her duties and we had a new judge come in and this new judge, um, you can ask Sarah if she was there. It was just amazing. It was like, it was literally like a, a, a an amazing ending to a movie. And the judge basically said that CPS should have never have been involved and that I should have got my child right when we had a pickup order at the very beginning before CPS was called. And so there, you know, and she said that I did exactly everything I was supposed to do legally that I fought. I mean, that I stood up for my rights. And that's what she said was I stood up for my rights and she didn't have a problem with me being on marijuana because I had done um, these we had a therapist come into our home 
for about four months, almost five months. And she basically watched us um, and watched how I was with Lily and how Lily was when she was at home. And then I also did drug tests on the side. Um, and my drug tests were showing way, way high levels. I mean, as a medical user, they're going to be a little higher than just a recreational sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so all this stuff was being shown to the judge. The therapist wrote, said, I sat there with Mr. Fisher while he was, you know, in a lot of pain and he didn't have marijuana. And I've also sat there with Mr. Fisher while he sat on the porch and smoked a bowl. And I never seen any problem with his parenting judgment or his judgment at all when it came to Lily. Hmm. He was very well, you know, doing what he was supposed to be. He was being a dad. Yeah. And so, I mean, this judge was like, you know, we're not going to use this anymore. So, wow. um, what an amazing yeah, case. I mean, they, they dropped everything against me and, and let me have my kid. And now we are signing, you know, a huge lawsuit against the state of Washington because we have a judge stating that they should have never been involved. Hmm. And Boy. so, I mean, they put a lot of damage to my daughter. We will, um, uh, we're going to follow up on that, but before I, I we're going to have to close up this segment. Yeah. I'm going to keep you guys on the line for the next segment. Cause we're going to talk more about the Vicka and Jesse Thompson case with Mindy Griffiths from human solution, Sarah Frank from moms from marijuana international, Billy, give us real quick, a website or contact for fight for Lily. Yeah, it's www.fight number four lily.org. Okay. Um, or you can find us on uh, Facebook at the Fight for Lily Foundation. And Mindy for uh, Human Solution? It's www.thsintl.org. Okay. And Sarah for Moms for Marijuana? MomsForMarijuana.org. Okay, so we're going to take a little break, and uh, when we come back, we'll have our panel uh, still with us, and we're going to talk more about the Vic and Jesse Thompson case, the overall epidemic of CPS. Of course, we're also going to address the recent case of Alexandria Hill, the, the young girl who was killed by her foster parent after her real parent lost her over marijuana. You're listening to The Russ Belville Show. Stick around. We'll be right back with our panel. And uh, if you guys want to hold on into hour two, we can also take calls from our audience if you'd like. Twenty Radio on the go with our Shoutcast stream for all internet-enabled media players. Go to rad-r.us slash 420shout or just click the Shoutcast icon below the live radio feed at 420radio.org. You know Herb Thrasher from the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. Now get ready for Herb Age Designs for the proud cannabis consumer. Herb Age Designs, lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly. Herb Age Designs, we've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear. Herb Age Designs, we've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com and follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. In the interest of fair and balanced journalism, the Russ Belville Show presents the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. Using foul language and smoking marijuana go hand in hand. Real men and women exercise self-control instead of indulging such vices. This has been the anti-drug public service announcement of the day. To cure this sort of reefer madness, listen to the Russ Belville Show every weekday on 420radio.org. 
Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. You can't handle the truth. An entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. You have offended my family. Hey, this is great, man. And you have offended a Shaolin Temple. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. I know nothing. nothing. I support a change in law. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. We don't need no stinking budget. the words we the people be warned this is not your mother's marijuana you could ask yourself a question do i feel lucky well do you punk i want to ask you a bunch of questions i want to have them answered immediately surely you can't be serious i am serious and don't call me Shirley. radical rant all right welcome back everyone 45 after the hour and we're continuing our Panel discussion, marijuana is safer than child protective services. Joining us for the discussion, we've got Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International, Mindy Griffiths from The Human Solution, and Billy Fisher from the Fight for Lily Foundation. And uh, we're going to turn the discussion now to a current case, Vicka and Jesse Thompson up in Bellingham, Washington, who, uh, as I understand it, were uh, part of a legal marijuana business, and that has invited the wrath of Child Protective Services. Mindy, can you give us an idea what they're going through as far as, you know, losing their kid? What could happen? Uh, what's being threatened against them? Um, yeah, actually, I can. Um, from personal experience as well, I had my own issue with CPS because of medical marijuana. And the feelings of your family being ripped apart just puts you in a panic mode that um, that's unlike anything else. Um and um, what they're facing is the government telling them that they need, you know, what kind of choices they need to make as parents. And the, we, you know, we don't do that to people who choose to use Vicodin or who drink alcohol or coffee or take, you know, any of those other things. And so I, it's, um, it's scary. It's, it's affecting their whole life. I imagine some people out there listening must be thinking, wait a minute, Bellingham, Washington, not only is, is medical marijuana legal, recreational marijuana is legal. How, how is it legally possible for CPS to be doing this? I don't know. <laughs> Let's ask um, Sarah. Sarah, what's it, going on with this? It's up to their discretion as to decide whether they think there needs to be an investigation. Um, it's up to the courts to determine whether CPS is, is got a case. So, you know, it is my hope that today in Bellingham, a judge is going to determine that CPS is completely out of line. Okay. So now, Sarah, you've been studying this as well, and you alluded to in our previous segment about how CPS is basically making money on this deal. Uh, lead us through that. How does, how does taking kids away from marijuana-using parents lead to profit? Well, it's called job security. Every single job and every single provider, including psychologists and drug specialists, judges, court, or court clerks, um, all the social workers, the guardian ad litem, the CASA workers, they all get a paycheck every single week by continuing to throw people and children into the system. And what they have done with the medical marijuana law and how there, there is a protection in the Washington medical marijuana law but the word that they're using is solely, and the law says that they cannot solely use cannabis to restrict a parent's rights. So what they do is they throw out a million other allegations along with it. That way it's not solely anymore, but they can use it. And that's kind of like their little loophole they've been using in Washington State to remove children from marijuana users. And then they also throw out, you know, all sorts of other allegations, and there's always speculation and um, what they hope is that nobody 
forces them to provide evidence of harm because the law states that in order for a child to be removed from a home, there has to be substantial evidence of risk of harm or substantial evidence of already ongoing abuse. And what they're hoping is that the parents will just cooperate and sit down and do these meetings and just agree to do everything they say. That way they don't have to go to court. And even when they do go to court, they don't always present evidence. They just present um, allegations like they did in Billy's case. And the judge kind of just goes with it without any evidence. And that's where the appeals process comes into play. You have to make them be accountable for doing our criminal justice system the correct way with due process and evidence and witnesses. And that's a lot of where they get these parents is they don't know the system. They don't know how to navigate it or to fight it. And they don't know what their rights are. Besides, you know, keeping paychecks flowing to various CPS officials, is there other financial incentive? Are there are there grants or any sort of monies yeah. that are attached to quotas or anything like that? Yes. Thanks to President Bill Clinton in 1997, they passed the uh, Adoption and Safe Families Act, which gives um, social workers a financial cash incentive to place children for adoption or to get children into services because they get more federal funding next year for it. So they're using our children as currency to receive federal funding. And they, I mean, they'll come into a house and, and not even with marijuana use. We know of another case right now where the mother decided to have her children at home with a midwife and she decided against the doctor's recommendations of, um, steroids for a rash that one of her infants had gotten and CPS came in and took both of her twins as well as a one-year-old child Hmm. because of that and then they had allegations that she was vegan and that that was harming her children because she was breastfeeding and it they just grab onto anything they want or they withhold evidence as they did in Billy's case or they fabricate evidence as they do in many many cases Hmm. keeping children safe Financial incentive. Yeah, not only the financial incentive, but keeping children safe from the threat of vegan mother's breast milk. Come on now. (laughs) Seems a little ridiculous now. We've had social workers contact us to let us know that they've been told by their own supervisors that they have to keep these children in these beds and they can't move them from the bed until they have another child lined up to take their place. And why was this? Because they have a yacht payment due. And they need that incentive that each of these teams get in in child protective services. They have teams of social workers and supervisors and public defenders and psychologists. And if they don't meet these quotas, then they don't get their quarterly incentive bonus. Hmm. It also seem, would seem to me that if some of the incentive is built into successfully placing an adoption, then that perversely incentivizes taking kids from healthy homes and the younger the better you want to take a teenager out of a troubled home we might be a handful and hard to adopt out but an infant from a marijuana using parent is probably a really easy adoption exactly and i have a great example of that um when billy's daughter was taken she was six months old she was healthy caucasian little girl I had a 10-year-old child living at home. They alleged that Billy was such an abusive drug addict that he was going to pick up his child and he was going to abuse her just because he got so stoned. But all the while, they allowed my child to stay in his care. Wow. My child is 10 years old, not adoptable, but a six-month-old baby girl, she's adoptable. That is shocking. We are talking with our distinguished panel here on Marijuana is Safer Than Child Protective Services. Mindy Griffiths from The Human Solution. You can find them at T-H-S-I-N. Oh, I'm, I'm going to forget it. T-H-S. What's the address, Mindy? T-H-S-I-N-T-L.org. I was right in the first place. T-H-S-I-N-T-L.org. <laughs> you were. Uh, Billy Fisher from the Fight for Lily Foundation. Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International. And uh, if you guys want to stay on the line, we could take calls from our listeners in the next hour if you're available. I'm, a, I'm available. Yeah. All right. Let's keep it going then. Um, I also wanted to mention... Uh, okay, okay. Listen, before I get off the medical marijuana states, we've got 23 states that have recognition of medical marijuana at some level. Uh, it seems to me as if the more early adopting Western medical marijuana states have fewer protections in their laws in this regard than do the newer Eastern medical marijuana states. Is that generally true? Does anyone have a handle on that info? 
I would assume that it is true because a lot of times you learn from experience. So you have to experience these cases that are, you know, being, um, that they don't have protection for in these early legal states and the other states see that and they, you know, they learn from that, from that other state and they put in a protection. Mm -hmm. And I believe in Washington, it took like 10 years to actually get a parental protection in place. Um, and even, now we need even to work on striking the word solely from it. Yeah. Even with a loophole, it took 10 years to get it in. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mindy. Hey Russ, I have something to add to that. Um, the, um, in Washington, they have been, you know, updating their laws, but there's other things like if you get pulled over in your vehicle and you have cannabis in your vehicle and you have a child in your vehicle, CPS has to be called and the child is removed. Wow. Period. Okay. So um, you must have seen my picture. <laughs> the more the, the more laws that there are put on the books, the more people that are going to jail and losing their kids. Um, it's passing laws isn't keeping people. Um, giving their, them their freedom. Mm. Well, it would seem to me right. that we need to pass some sort of law to recognize this right of cannabis using parents to maintain their custody. I guess yeah, I exactly. Billy, go ahead. Um, I wanted to add, I actually read a thing today um, that normal, I think it was normal Washington shared about how the spike in marijuana DUIs in Washington has increased um, like a lot. And what they're finding out is actually right in the law in 502, it states that when the police officer pulls you over, um, he is required by law to call CPS and have your children taken right there on the spot. No questions asked. Like it doesn't ha matter. They go to foster care for at least two days until there's a shelter care hearing. So, I mean, they, it, it's seriously, it's just a money game and, and everything that's going on here. And so these laws, they do, they need the protection. And that's why we uh, made Lily's law or we're coming up with Lily's law that protects these medical marijuana patients um, or even just recreational parents. You know, I mean, that's the whole thing. They've got to be able to prove that you're, you're high and that you're putting your children in harm's way. And yeah, that it it is just, it's really hard. It doesn't even matter if you're high. And that's what the judge said in Billy's case is that, well, obviously he's high. Obviously he's using marijuana. But what matters is whether or not they have sufficient evidence of impairment and of abuse that is being caused or neglect that is being caused because of that impairment. And like in Vicka and Jesse's case or in Billy's case, they don't have that evidence because there's nothing that has occurred because of their impairment. And what they're doing with these laws where they just automatically take your child is they're assuming that marijuana is dangerous. So you having marijuana is dangerous because your child is there. Mm -hmm. And that's where they're just dead wrong. Marijuana, we all know, is not dangerous. And what is dangerous is throwing children into foster care, ripping them from their homes, and putting them in situations where they're six times more likely to be abused than if they were at home with a marijuana-consuming parent. Yeah, uh, those are some of the stats I've seen that, that, you know, regardless, even we take marijuana out of the equation, removing a kid from their folks and putting them in foster care puts them at greater risk of lots of dangers. And so it should be a last resort. I don't think anybody here is against, you know, t CPS taking kids out of a dangerous, dangerous, bad situation. I want to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about here. But uh, in the case of marijuana using parents, uh, I think in many areas of law, just not parenting, but we have laws about alcohol and we don't automatically assume a parent that has a glass of wine with dinner is a, is a bad parent, a danger to their kids and needs to be, have their kids removed from them. We don't automatically assume that somebody who uh, drove home from having a couple beers at Applebee's, uh, got their kid in the back seat, is necessarily a bad parent. So we're going to continue this discussion in our hour two. Toker Talk Radio will put up our call in line if you'd like some to make a call, a comment, or a question for our panel on marijuana is safer than CPS, please uh, feel free to dial at 971-533-7111. We're on the line with Mindy Griffiths from The Human Solution, Billy Fisher from The Fight for Lily Foundation, and Sarah Frank from Moms for Marijuana International. That's all the time we got for Hour 1, but stay tuned. Hour 2 is next. Toker Talk Radio. For everyone here at 420radio.org, I'm Radical Russ. Until next time, take care of each other, Tokers.
This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seat, you plan it, you're growing, you're giant, you're rolling, you're smoking. You take a seat, you plan it, you're growing, you're giant, you're rolling, you're smoking.